Thank you. <laughs> cool. Yeah, let's start from like the traditional view on machine learning. So when we do machine learning and computer science, we often consider static isolated setting. We start from a data set and we aim to fit patterns in the data. So here is a couple of like competitions that are used by the community to bench benchmark machine learning methods. So there are competitions like display advertising challenge from Critio, where they have a bunch of, they have all the click logs with which people, which websites people visited, what they clicked on over like a certain time frame. They make this data public so people can like benchmark their machine learning models on how well these models can predict what users click on. There's a data set from, offered from Silo where the goal is to predict um, sales prices for real estate. There's a data for credit default risk prediction. So you have like features of an individual and you try to predict how likely is this person to default on a loan. Um, there are other data sets where you try to predict like poverty level and so on. So in all these settings, you take the data, you split it, train test, you learn a model and you try to recover the, the patterns in the data as good as can. So that's like in standard supervised learning, the traditional goal. All, all people in this workshop know that that's not like where the story ends. So these predictions are then often used to inform decisions. So for the examples that we've seen, mixed through rate prediction is used to inform targeted advertising. See those set estimates are used to, they are released to buyers. You have like this map where you see how much each house is worth and you can like make, yeah, make up your mind on how much you think it's actually worth. Um, credit risk prediction is used to allocate interest rates. So if you're likely to default, you probably get like a, have to pay a higher interest rate because the bank wants to make profit. Um, poverty index scores are used to allocate resources. So the story doesn't end with predictions, but these predictions, they impact people. They inform decisions and they somehow impact people. So let me give you a couple of examples here. So let's say you Google Maps, you're making predictions about traffic. You make these predictions public. People use them to decide where they drive. And it will again like impact traffic patterns. So there's like some interesting feedbacks here. And this is data from London, public data. You see traffic on large roads, traffic on small roads. And that, this is when Google Maps was released. So it really changed traffic patterns in, in London. Now I touched the thing. Um, this is a very different example. That's um, an example from a social welfare program in Colombia. It's like a very interesting paper by Kamok and Konobar, um, where they plot the distribution of a poverty index score in the population. It's like 80 million people, um, individuals in Colombia, and they designed this poverty index to identify people that are most in need for support. This is how the distribution initially looked in 1995 when they designed this score. Um, this is what happens when the data, uh, the score was used as a targeting instrument. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Not able to deal with like touch screens. Okay. Um, now we are the same. Up to speed again. Okay. So we see how the distribution shifted after this poverty index score was used as a targeting instrument. People wanted to get like subsidies. So, and politicians wanted it. It's just like a lot of dynamics happened in the population. So this distribution shifted in response to these scores. Um, another example to just drive home the point. This is about financial markets. That's a quote from McKinsey's book. I think it's the engine not a camera or from like a, a, an article about option pricing theory. So they argue that option pricing theory succeeded empirically, not because it discovered pre-existing pricing patterns, but because it pushed the market to conform to its prediction. So once you release um, an economic model for a market and people start acting upon it, they use it to like describe markets. They use the parameters to talk about markets. They use the predictions to inform their investment decisions. This can have like huge impacts on the market. 
yeah, we have this everywhere. So predictions mediate our everyday lives. They moderate public discourse, redirect the attention and shape preferences. Um, predictions of like ranking content, what we search, what we like, what we click, what we watch. So it's everywhere. Um, so these downstream effects of predictions, it's not something new, right? That's something that has historically been discussed in different works. So here's an, here are a couple of like references for why it's a bad idea to ignore cause and effects of predictions. Um, this is like an old paper by Kunberg and Modigliani called The Predictability of Social Events. And in this paper, they very nicely argue how there's a difference between private predictions and public predictions. If predictions are public, you need to take causal effects into account. If you keep it private, if you do machine learning like within your office, it doesn't really matter. But that's like uh, an interesting paper where this phenomena came up. There's also the concept of Goodhart's law, I think most of you are familiar with, saying that any statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is put up on it for control purposes. And also related to this Lucas critiques, where they say that um, macroeconomic policy can disrupt the statistical pattern that initially motivated the policy. So people found that it's really important. It can, there are like a lot of pitfalls if you don't really take this into account. Now coming back to machine learning. So why does this matter for machine learning? Because the data that we train on reflects society. So we make predictions and then we have predictions impact people, impact data, so there's a feedback loop. Did you have a question or? Ah, sorry, I thought you were. Thank you. Okay. Um, because there's a, there, there's a feedback loop now because you can think of data describing people. And the title of my talk is performative prediction. So we borrow this concept from, I think it appeared in like different disciplines. We use it to talk about predictions that impact the party. So about this feedback loop. By performative. By performative. Oh, no, by, by the use of performance. I'm just curious where the name came from. Performativity <laughs> is a concept of like language cell, like reinforcing. If you make claims, they become true. There are like a lot of these. Um, Self-fulfilling prophecies. Yeah, not only self-fulfilling prophecy, but sort of the the causal power of predictions. That's really what it, what it is about. Causal power of language. It's like, yeah, I think it's a very interesting concept. That's very different to us. Maybe some people here know more than I do. About and our individual, individuals know they're going to be used as data later on? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So there are very different, many different facets to this. Um, are people, do they know that what they do will impact the predictions they get, right? That's like one way you can think about it. Um, I think this will, whether they do or don't know, will lead to like different dynamics. So this uh, paper which I really like called the model selection class, which shows exactly this. Okay. You cannot have, yeah, you can't people account for this. Then, uh, yeah, class. so this is a very general, like macro level description of the phenomena. I think they're very, a lot of very different in, and interesting instantiations. But I, I'll get to that. So in this talk, I will present performative prediction, a general conceptual framework to reason about the causal power of prediction in like machine learning, supervised learning context. Um, I'll talk about different solution concepts that emerge from this perspective. I'll go a bit into optimization results, but not too much because this is like an econ um, or at least an interdisciplinary workshop. So I don't want to. <laughs> for the with optimization results. Um, I want to focus a bit more on economic modeling, so the, the role of econ in that picture. Um, I will also, I also want to talk a bit about power, because I think there's a very interesting connection between performativity and power and digital market regulation that I want to touch upon in a second part. Um, are there any questions up to here for like the motivation? Uh, about the motivation, um, it, it looked like, is the uh, topic of the discussion um, supervised learning and exclusively supervised learning? Or are we also considering in this setup reinforcement learning? Okay, so the framework that I will present is intentionally an extension of supervised learning. 
um, because I think it's very illustrative to think of it as like this dynamic that are caused by prediction as something on top of supervised learning instead of a special case of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a super broad framework. You could cast this in the context of reinforcement learning, but what does this, it's unclear what this helps you. Um, what I will show is that this simple conceptual framework gives us a nice, clean, theoretical concept we can work with and we can get interesting results that you cannot necessarily get in that with the existing tools of art. Is this going to the, <laughs> yes. because you said, I, I cannot see what, what it adds to like, reinforcement learning. I, I was thinking that because reinforcement learning gets the feedback immediately, I was thinking that precisely that kind of like, probably there's issues, I don't know, but like it takes into account that the data gets again. So there's a loop. There's, not, a loop. Yeah. there's also a loop here. Okay, okay. Um, so, let's, we can pick that up after the talk, Thank then it becomes maybe a loop. So, let me start from the standard way of how we do predictions in machine learning. So we have a risk function and we evaluate the population as a distribution over data instances, feature label pairs. Um, we represent the predictive model with parameter vector. So I will use that throughout the talk, this parametric uh, risk minimization. And we aim to find a model that minimizes the risk on a given distribution. Now, what is performativity about? It's about data distribution depending on the model that's being deployed. This is something that you cannot talk about in that framework because the distribution is sampled prior to the model existing. There's no way that the, the data can sort of depend on if the, you take the features, you make predictions that this impacts the outcome. There's no way this works in this model where you jointly sample X and Y pairs. Yes? Just to clarify, my understanding of the loops critique is that it was essentially going to the parametric relationship. So in effect, society, reacted in a way that we changed that here we would under it now. But we're not thinking about that here. It just affects the input task. Is that correct? Um, so we're thinking of, so the data are X, Y pairs, and we're thinking of a model inducing a certain distribution, a certain state. So data could be different pairs. Yes, data are pairs. Right, thank you. So we introduced the concept of a distribution map which is right D of theta for the distribution induced by theta. And you can think of this as a yeah, macro level description of the distribution. And given this tool, um, we can now write down the performative risk, which is no longer the risk over a fixed distribution, but the risk after deployment. So you keep the objective function the same. So you're still interested in the predictive loss. Um, so yes, I'm not seeing this as like a new objective. I'm seeing this as a way to describe what's going on in supervised learning if you're a distribution response to your model. Um, but yes, it's the same law. It's just L. You can plug in what you want, any utility or life loss function that you're interested in. But if I talk about the performative risk, I mean the risk after deployment. So just in my head, so yeah. feel free to stop me, but I'm just trying to, to think through how this relates to something like optimal text theory, for instance, in economics or mechanism design more broadly, right? Maybe when you can think of that also as picking some theta, like some text rates, for instance, right? Which is which is a way of maybe predicting surfeitness transfers or something like that. Um, but maybe also, I guess, um, think about the, the loss function differently depending on on in some sense where um, the p will be changed by the by the parameters or by other factors. Sorry, this is a bit No, I think it's a great question. I mean, it, it's know, completely sorry, changed the meaning of a lot of the end of theorem picking in that says that if you respond in your behavior to what mm -hmm. incentives are put on you, the first order I'm not going to care about this behavioral response. Yeah, I think this, go, this is going a bit further than what I want to yeah. do in the problem set now. Um, we can discuss that a bit later, but I agree that thinking of it this way changes the meaning of the last one. Um, I think that's important. And it will become clear throughout the talk. Uh, I think it's, it helps if we... Yes. Quick, sorry, <laughs> yes. quick clarifying question. Just so the, just on the, a restriction on the loss here though, is that sort yes. of whatever I'm optimizing, once I observe C, I know what the realized loss was for that observation, right? So, so that, okay, perfect. Yes. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, this is just like a, just, like imagine, I, I don't know any economics. So can you just explain to me the difference again between phi and the like of phi? Sorry, uh, theta. 
So theta is the model, the machine learning yeah. model I deploy, and T of theta is the distribution that it uses. So features of people. Uh, I deploy a model. They change their behavior, so I have a D of phi is a representation of black people. Perfect, thanks. So this gives this perspective on risk minimization gives two different solution concepts. So you can think of formative optimality and performative stability, um, which I think both are natural. For economists, probably performative optimality is more natural um, as like the optimal thing after deployment. For machine learning, I argue that performative stability is also a supernatural notion. So um, Translated system, uh, translated into Nash equilibrium versus Stackelberg. In this particular instantiation, where you assume that this is sort of best response of the population, yes. But like in one case, it's like first the fixed as theta ps, and then the theta. The... Let me let me go to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. So I what I want to argue here is that exposing this distribution dependence on the parameter gives rise to two different solution concepts that we can think of. If this were just D in both cases, you wouldn't see the difference. So performative optimality is the optimal risk after deployment. Performative stability is a natural equilibrium notion of observation driven optimization. You deploy a model, you observe the data, and now you see the model I had is optimal on what I observed. So it, it's like a natural notion of optimality. And here, Okay, um, so what I want to do next is to give you a couple of uh, insights into what type of like theoretical results we can get with like this simple abstraction. But just and to make sure I understand, right? So the performative optimality is I, I get to pick the theta POX and then commit to it, whereas for the stability, I, there's kind of a relief that happens later in some sense. Uh, and the one is still be optimal after that, right? So it's, in it's like in a way a difference between this commitment and without commitment. Yeah. If I can make sure you understand what's going on. Nothing you want me to say. <laughs> there, there is a mismatch in keywords that computer scientists and economists use, uh, and this is exactly the confusion. You're right, it's the difference between Stackelberg and, and uh, Nash, but it's not necessarily Stackelberg in terms of uh, best response. Yes, yeah, so optimality, I believe, is commitment. You committed, and stability is lack of commitment. Thank you. Yeah, it's just yeah, a, maybe it's, the, a, it's a gap in the keywords of not this computer science. Yeah, I think it's a, a bit of a different way of, of thinking about it. I think of this ability as you deploy a model, you observe the distribution, and the point you see is optimal from the distribution you have. That's why you stop. I will talk about retraining a bit later, and then it becomes clear. So it's a natural, stable point of retraining. Yeah. You deploy a model, you observe the distribution, and then you stop when your model looks optimal on what you have. But that's not necessarily for the person to commit extent in not taking into account exactly. responses. Yes, exactly. You don't know so far, I assume that I don't know the opposite. It's an abstract thing. I haven't modeled. Economists are used to modeling it. I haven't modeled it. It's just the abstract distribution and try to see what it implies if this distribution depends on the model. Cool. So now I want to first do not a modeling assumption, but a sensitivity assumption on the distribution. So I want to make the assumption that if the, if the model parameters change slightly, the distribution also only changes slightly. So let's, for example, say we have a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then if I have if small changes in model parameter leads to small changes in predictions, this will also lead to small changes in output, in like such a model, just like to give you some intuition. A similar thing is if you have consequential decisions, then small changes to a decision boundary only impact few individuals. That's what's W. I have some illustration here. W is the Wasserstein distance. Uh, it's a Wasserstein distance between the distribution, sort of some optimal transport distance. So this is like an illustration. Let's say of data points, we have a decision boundary. We change the decision boundary a little bit. This only impacts a few people that are in orange. If I change it more, it impacts more people. So it's trying to match, have this sort of Lipschitz relationship between model changes and distribution. And I want to later contrast that to modeling in income. But for now, I just want to commit to the function and show a couple of results that we can get 
using sensitivity. So the first one is retraining, coming back to what we talked about before. So retraining is a very natural heuristic in machine learning to deal with distribution shifts. If you deploy a model, you see it's not optimal anymore, you like retrain. And you just do that to chase any sort of like shift. What we have here is a very specific shift that's due to changes in a model. So we can, again, apply these heuristics. We deploy a model, observe distribution, optimize on the new distribution, and repeat. And you can formally show that if the loss is strongly convex and smooth and the distribution map is not too sensitive, then this procedure can converge. So this is sort of interesting because this heuristic, the meaning of this heuristic is now like a natural equilibrium dynamic and performance prediction. Strongly convex and smooth in both the theta and the D. Um, strongly convex in theta, smooth and in both. Hmm? Strongly convex in theta and smooth in both. And what's kind of interesting is you need strong convexity. Convexity is not sufficient. Um, compared to like standard optimization results, because you need sufficient gain in optimization to offset like the loss from the shift because that's kind of the intuition. Um, so similar results can be shown beyond like risk minimization. So you can think of the risk as an empirical risk. So so far I only talked about distributions. Right? You can think of it as an empirical risk, or you can do gradient steps. And there are like results for these cases where you can show that with sufficient sample and concentration arguments, you get convergence with gradient updates and the right step size, you can also get convergence under similar conditions, although it's likely like still work. You can do the exercise for stochastic optimization where you observe a sample at the time. And there are like many other extensions Interesting, like follow up works here on proximal point method, projected gradient methods, um, results about time dependent shifts, and multiplayer performative predictions. I think in all these results, is the, a lot of them work with this sensitivity assumption, and there's always like this relationship between properties of the loss and the sensitivity of the data that allows you to make these claims, these convergence results. Can I think about this in the evolutionary game series? Sense very. Uh, there's like another population that responds to like one population shifting their status and then you mean the multiplayer thing I mean, I, mean, I, I don't uh, it looks very similar to me like the another replica the dynamics and an evolutionary cell for instance i'm sure they are like interesting interesting connections here i don't know the, i don't know the details um one thing i want to mention here for people interested in stochastic optimization what's cool here is that you get the sample at the time but with every sample you can decide whether you want to deploy or continue updating on the distribution you have. Every time you deploy, you cause a shift. So here, let's say you update four times, you deploy the green one, and then you cause a shift, you change your problem, and then you continue updating on the new one. And there's sort of an interesting trade-off here in how many samples you collect per distribution, how often you deploy, depending on your cost of deployment and sample collection, you can also not choose as well. Yeah, I think that's what I have to say about like performative stability for now. So it's really this natural equilibrium on the retraining. <coughs> yes. Just a question about that. Do we know about sort of, I guess, under the convexity restrictions, like is the is there a unique performatively stable? Yeah, so in, or? in this setting of the theorem, it's unique. Oh. Strong convexity is unique. Okay. Thank you. But it must not be. Oh, it's not necessarily unique. Um, cool. So that was like what I wanted to say about performative stability. And now coming back to performative optimality, is what we clarifying a bit what we discussed before. So this means that you take the distribution shift into account when optimizing. You optimize through the response of the population. So here's a quick illustration why stable points are not necessarily optimal. So stable points are minimizer on the D of theta, so it's, it's a minimizer on the distribution it induces. Optimal points can have smaller risk, but they are not necessarily locally optimal. I'm not even touching. <laughs> <laughs> they are not necessarily sort of locally optimal in the sense that they, it's it's hard to certify that. Once you deploy them and you observe the data, it's very hard to say whether they are optimal or not. Because you would need to know the cause and effect on D of changing theta. Exactly. You would need to know what other D of theta to sort of certify. But from a machine learning perspective of looking at the data and evaluating your model, it's very hard. 
So there are two different approaches if you want to find these points, or probably there are more, but just two I'm going to talk about. One is experimentation and the other one is modeling. So with experimentation, I mean like A-B testing, you do iterative evaluations or some sort of black box of optimization to find it, assuming that you do not know the of theta a priori. And then there's the other approach, which is a bit more common, I think, in econ or there are these interesting models in econ of having a sort of closed form expression for this P of theta, or maybe some parameters that you still need to estimate and then optimize through it um, and evaluate the solution. And yes. I wonder if you could explain a bit more um, black box optimization and understand A-B testing and quality evaluation. Let me um, go through this slide and then I will I come back to your, see if I answer your question. So by black box, I mean that you deploy a model, you observe the distribution, and you evaluate the performative risk on that distribution. So you have like black box access to PR of theta. So PR is an unknown function that you want to optimize, and you can just query it. Okay. That's that sounds like zero cost. That's significant cost. Of, oh, is it costly to, to, to obtain some? You deploy a model, you observe how people respond. And you like look at what happens. Yeah. Yes. In most cases, yes. In most cases, there are also a lot of constraints. But just from an optimization perspective, you can cast it in this framework. You can throw away the information that's not just not the loss. You throw away like the outcome and covariate chains. Um, you mean the D of theta? Yes. Um, it's the next uh, box. Um, I, I was wondering in the previous slide, how does an AB test? Help us solve the issue of this uh, of the well the, of the shift in the distribution. If I'm only affecting ten percent of the population with this, uh, you know, this treatment, how how do I which properties do I need to have on the population so that yes, I, I see the shift before it happens. Or something like that. Okay, maybe I'm. Um using the term or I have something slightly different in mind. With A-B tests, I really have experimentation in mind. You have a model, you deploy it, but what sort of YouTube does with their recommendation algorithm? They deploy it, they have different groups to see what happens, and they pick the one that performs better. I, I, I think of it as a sort of experimentation. You really have to go and deploy. That's the point I have to, I wanted to make with like experimentation. You might have equilibrium effects in mind, but there's like, uh, there's spillovers, right, yeah. such as what your own theta is yes, okay. theta. I, I agree. So there are like limitations to that. The point I want to make is that you need to go and deploy and see what happens if you don't have a model. And A-B testing is one way of doing it. And under certain assumptions, you can use it to make inference about it. Thank you very much. So um, coming back to your question about throwing away information. So that's like the standard black box naive optimization approach would be to go deploy theta, observe PR of theta, and then try to use Lipschitzness or anything else to build confidence funds. What we can do here is we can, without not throwing away this information, we can extrapolate the risk of theta on the of theta. Right, we also have the information about the distribution. So what we are left with is the uncertainty due to the distribution shift. That's just like uh, something interesting here in the context of bandits, which adds a bit uh, a new perspective on top. Um, but I, yeah, I don't want to go. the predictive optimality, I would assume that if I use a counterfactual theta, the D would shift, right? So in that case, I don't really care about this function per se. You care about risk of theta on D of theta. Right. And if I build confidence bounds, and but I can evaluate the loss on the existing distribution of another model, and then all I'm left with is the uncertainty on how the distribution shifts. If I if I'm not doing this, I have more, I have potentially more uncertainty because the the model changes and the distribution changes. Right. If my loss is super steep going up here, from this evaluation, I know that I don't have to evaluate it here. Or you can't know that the cannot move too much. Yeah, so exactly. So it, it allows you to get out tighter confidence bounds using the sensitivity assumption we've seen before. Some sort of lipschitzness in how the distribution shifts, 
can in many cases give you a stronger bounds if you evaluate the loss instead of just completely looking at the pools here. So to translate this into econometric terms, it sounds like with the sensitivity, we have a partial identification of how the counterfactual risk would look like. Yes. Probably, yeah. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm a computer scientist, so you know probably better than I do. But um, you, you know how it shifts in one argument. That's why you evaluate it and just have uncertainty over the other. If you were to throw away the information, as you mentioned, you bounce with the yeah. worst. You would only get the points. You would get the points and then probably some cones because you make some global literacy yeah. assumption. Um, yeah, I, I decided not to put in the detail of the results, but the point I want to make is that sensitivity is sufficient here for some interesting bandit bounds. Um, coming back to the other question about the cost. So there is like some serious limitation to this like block, black box optimization approach, which is that um, you want to incorporate constraints on exploration. You can't just go and try out like all models and see what happens. Um, you want to respect the cost of like deployment risk and cost of deployment, and also ideally incorporate prior knowledge so you can really reduce the necessary need for employment. That's something that's, um, yeah, that's not addressed by this approach. And that's, there are very interesting results in like other fields, data exploration in bandits. I'm sure there are also interesting results in econ that would apply here or could be translated into that framework. And the assumption of the result. So, basically, any additional information I would have about the counterfactual, the uh, could somehow explore more efficiently. Exactly. Yeah. Let's say video bandits, you could like plug in one sort of ideas here. So, that's just what I wanted to say about like exploration based. So, that's probably as far as you get without assumptions on the of data, just this Lipschitz's assumption. Now, if you want to go beyond that, um, you can do some modeling. Um, also, a, uh, a way of like incorporating prior knowledge. Uh, the example I've picked here to present is strategic classification. So this is where you assume the distribution map comes from strategic behavior of individuals that are trying to get like a better outcome. Um, this model is used in in the literature. It's like a rational agent model. You assume that the individuals pick the feature in response to the predictor such that they, uh, they have optimized the gain from a positive outcome minus the cost of manipulation. So it's some simple rational agent model here. Uh, it's a kind of T of theta is then the aggregate that comes about from this individual data points moving. So I have a let me try, I try to illustrate that here so you, you can get a sense for the model. So think of it that each data point as an individual, the blue line is the decision boundary. So individuals that can afford it within the red bounds, they try to move across the decision boundary. And then you get this sort of shift from here to here. Um, yeah, so there are like, it's a great advantage of this precise modeling. You can now like really compute, perform, you can compute performative optimal analysis if you have such a well specified model. Um, here, Performative optima correspond to Stackelberg equilibrium. In this game, where like the firm leads, the people respond. Um, I don't want to go more into. There's like a lot of very interesting work in Stackelberg games that um, has interesting connections to performance prediction. I don't. Yeah, I, I can't like outline all of them. I think Nika is a much better person to talk about them. Um, one thing I want to highlight here, which I find super interesting, is the tension between micro and macro. So this modeling of strategic classification is some sort of micro foundation model. You try to explain the aggregates to individual behavior. We all know that like these models are not the perfect reflection of reality. People never perfectly does respond. But there's like an interesting implication here for machine learning, which is that this is an example of like strategic adaptation. If you have like a threshold here, you get this very, you get these degenerate aggregates. And what machine learning does, it optimizes on aggregates. So all the results we've seen so far, they depend on distributions. And what we found is that sort of these degenerate aggregates, I mean, it's, it's kind of okay. We know that it's not perfectly reflecting reality, but we also find that they sort of lead to brittle conclusions about learning dynamics. If you use them within like retraining analysis and they can also give you like large negative externalities. 
because if you make this like it, it's like a worst case assumption on how people respond and if they deviate slightly from it you often like overdo your your adaptation and like this strategic classification setting so the just is just if the model is slightly wrong the conclusion is very wrong is that very if the model is slightly different the conclusion is very different yeah. yes mm -hmm. things that converge in retraining do not converge anymore if you make like small changes so there's like, I, I just think there's something interesting I wanted to find out here, which is like people here have like a lot in, some people that might have interesting insights. Other models, of course, there are a lot of other ways to model populations. What I present is just one rational agent model. You can have variations in how you instantiate costs, model family, partial information. Um, there are interesting results on strategic classification that don't exactly know the decision boundary, where you sort of try to reveal or not reveal like what you're doing um, and whether it's good or bad, but what actually happens. I think there was a result in the previous talk about sometimes hiding some information can be beneficial. Um, there's beyond rationality and then social interactions. As you mentioned, it's also a very important part of life modeling. Um, another way you could go about it are more like a structural causal model perspective. You try to understand how does the predictor enter my data generation process and try to make structural assumptions on that way. This is often also without interference, right? If you make this um, sutra assumption in causal inference, you could also go about just macro level modeling of the distribution map. Just say it's a Gaussian where the mean shifts with the prediction. Um, I don't have like, this is just a list of like, trying to show that there's like very interesting connections here to sort of modeling at different levels. Yeah, so once you have these assumptions, you can do a lot of methods. Cool, yeah, what I've talked so far is uh, performativity. I hope to have convinced you that it's sort of very important. And if you make prediction problems in social context, you have to, you should think about it. You probably knew that before, but I think it's very like an important concept. Performative prediction offers sort of a nice abstraction to talk about it. We have seen different solution concepts and like optimization challenges and the tension between or sort of the sensitivity assumption and like modeling approaches. Cool. Um any questions so far? How much how, until then do I have? Oh, like 75 to 90 minutes coming. Maybe that's right. Uh, at 2.15, I think. Let's go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. right. yeah. yeah, something about sensitivity. So, because you're saying it's a sensitivity assumption, so it's not a property of, it's not measured. Okay, that's a great question. So, it's like a Lipschitz constant, and the assumption is it being small enough. Okay. <laughs> yes. So it only a lot of the results only hold if it's small enough compared to like the strong convexity. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Two, two, just two, two thoughts, I guess, just on the related to the exploration um, bit. I guess one thing, it, just on the on the practical side, I guess something that does come to mind is just that often to get sort of the the steady state D of theta in context involving people, often you'll need to wait a while. Like I guess. You know, like looking at the the Google Maps one you showed, right? There was a there's a that was a fun like um, yes. right, discontinuity in the derivative when Google Maps was implemented, but then sort of slow convergence. I guess do you do you think that sort of the exploration based approach sort of there's any hope for it actually to be usable in these contexts, or do you feel like realistically we sort of have to go to the modeling based approach here? Okay, yeah, there are like a couple of interesting points you just brought up. So. Exploration, pure exploration, no, I, I would never do that. I mean, you would go, you would do some sort of, or at least what YouTube does, you can go into some like Rex's paper they publish. We use offline metrics to find good models and then we use live experiments to guide like the final decisions of how to change it. So you would go to a reasonable model and then you would do some local experimentation to see how things behave locally. Um, this I could see. But beyond that, that's you can also think of it as some sort of maybe model, um, mm -hmm. some sort of constraint exploration. Um, yeah, I think models are super powerful here, which is, I think it's important to keep this micro macro thing in mind when you talk about models, but mm -hmm. yeah. 
Um, there was another thing you brought up, which is the time dependence of the shift. So yes, these shifts are can be time dependent. The model here assumes this away. So the model assumes there's a deployment of theta and then there's a d of theta. You can think of it, as you said, like an equilibrium state that emerges, or you can just think of it as sort of a fixed time interval. Mm -hmm. I think you have these problems a lot also in causal inference. If you make a deployment, when do you measure the causal effect? Right? I think it's very related to these two days. Mm -hmm. There's not really the right answer. It's just the model abstracts it away, and I think it's nice that we can still, there's still interesting things you can say without time. Um, one of the follow ups that I linked has some model of like a Markov chain, how like the state evolves. Um, yes. But here there's no time. There's just the of theta is after a fixed time interval. Okay, so I have, yeah, I've talked about the framework of performative prediction and how it differs from supervised learning. And now I want to talk about how performative prediction works. That's a, something I have not really talked about yet. And I want to lead with an example. We've seen like the traffic prediction example. Like imagine that Google makes some changes to their traffic prediction algorithm. Imagine TomTom makes some changes to their traffic prediction algorithm. Something different happens, right? Google can potentially have like much more effect on like the aggregate traffic in Germany, or I don't know whether you know TomTom at all, so, but in Germany or <laughs> versus like TomTom. The same thing with like the um, public versus private predictions, right? Public predictions have formativity, private still, even if you try to predict the same thing on the same data. Right? So there's something interesting here about it depending on who makes the predictions and it depending on some intuitive notion of power, right? Google has a much more dominant position in like the markets than Thumbtum. It's Downloaded much. Okay, I, I have to admit it's like a distorted number because it's on Google Play, but um, you, you get the point. Right? Google Maps is, is used much more. And so, what I want to try to do in the rest of the talk is to sort of discuss a bit whether we can use performativity to reason about power in predictive systems. And um, here's a lexical definition of power to just try to convince you why this could make sense. It's the capacity or ability to direct or influence others or the course of events. So it's very similar to what we've seen, right? You deploy a model and you kind of, you, you can have an impact on, on people, on population. Um, so you th should think of this in like the context of digital platforms. So that use predictive models to sort of make decisions on how to arrange content, what to recommend, which brands to suggest. So that's the context I'm, I'm thinking about. And there's like a lot of ongoing work on like thinking about how to regulate these markets. Um, so this seems to be like very challenging and tricky for like current tools. This is from like the Sticker Committee on Digital Platforms report from 2019. So that's like a committee of experts, policymakers, um, economists. So it's a lot of uh, a huge committee, and they they filed they worked on this for a year, and they filed this report. And it's about like challenges of regulating these markets. Um, one common and um, one um, sentence, two sentences I took out of it is that it's sort of hard to pinpoint the locus of competition because markets are often multi-sided, um, which economists have little experience with, and market de definition is a hurdle for enforcement. Um, so other things that came up in the report, I found it pretty interesting is that, um, so things like behavioral aspects. So in these markets, you have this sort of single homing, people following um, recommendations. There's just a lot of these like more social aspects that are very important for market and market power that you don't have in classical pricing markets. Um, here is like, yeah, this market definition, the thing that keeps coming up that you really need to understand. In a lot of these um, standard enforcement tools, you need to understand what kind of competition model you have and how the market works, which is very hard here because it's super complex and multi-sided. And here's like another quote from the European Commission who has who calls for like less emphasis on the analysis of market definitions and more emphasis on the theory of harm and identifying anti-competitive conduct really a bit more back to the effect-based measures. 
So that's like the context you should have in mind for like, what I'm gonna talk about next. Which is a definition of power inspired performativity, so by performance prediction. It's it's basically what I kind of said before, turning it a bit on its head. So we say performative power is the largest change a firm can cause to a population with respect to a set of action and attitudes. So it's some sort of causal notion. You define a population um, where you're interested in, you take a firm, you look at their actions, and you see how much change they can cause. Um, so here's like a formal definition. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail here because that's not like the main point I want to make, but it's uh, performative power is defined as the supremum over a set of actions on average over a population. And this is the distance between the, think, think of C as an individual data point and CF as the counterfactual if the firm were, were to change their model to F. So what people click on, or I think I have it. Yeah, yeah. So let's think of Google. That's their decisions of how to display ads. Um, that's a population of interest. The content they click on, the content they will click on under the content factor. It's very abstract so far. But I think what is, um, yeah, you need a bit more time to digest it, or do you want to have any questions on like the ethical measure? So I'm, I'm just curious about like getting a bit of a better grip on this notion of performative power. So I I guess in some cases like social media is highly dependent on individuals within social media as well. So I might advertise, um, you know, I don't know, a pair of jeans, and it might reach, or, you know, people might shift their preference, or I mean, people might change, or you know, also post pictures of the jeans. But then an influencer picks it up and uh, posts a picture of them in the jeans, and suddenly. That's going to change everything. Suddenly, everybody is going to, or many more people are going to change their behavior. Is does that fall under this definition of performative power that you're? Um, I think so. Oh. I I think so. So, if you want to go and investigate performative power, you would pick a population you're interested in. Yeah. And I think what you said is that depending on what this population is, the measure of power is very different. Mm -hmm. So it's the power of a firm. It's not just the power of a firm, right? It's the power of a firm with respect to a set of actions to a population of interest. Okay. It's it's like this type signature for power, which I think is like quite powerful. I'm still like, yeah. So okay, somewhat related question. Uh, or, yes, no, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, somewhat related question, which is, I guess, is there a, it feels like there, and please, please feel free to postpone, uh, yeah. but there's a notion of, Sort of the cost to the firm of taking the action. So, for example, like if if YouTube sort of started auto playing a fact a video of like expose videos about factory farming before every video played on YouTube. On the one hand, the fraction of YouTube users who are vegetarian would almost certainly go up. Yeah. On the other hand, the number of people using YouTube would go down would go down by yeah. a lot. And so, in some sense, it feels like that that cost. So, in that sense, that's sort of an action that YouTube could take, but almost certainly can't take or won't take long term. So that notion of cost. Yeah, that's exactly the right question to ask. So that's why Adam is here. So it's a set of <laughs> actions. You are going to specify what you consider plausible actions within the agency of the firm that they could do without, say, hurting their profit. You can define it as non-profit decreasing actions, for example, or like a certain threshold. Awesome. Do we still have the sensitivity, sensitivity function? Or so no, that's like, here it's now a bit different. What we use is still the idea that predictions or like algorithmic actions have positive effects. Um, it's different to sensitivity because we don't just care about how the aggregate changes, but we care about what happens to individuals. But could you take the average? Yes, but it's, um, think of this as the absolute value. If you swap two individuals, the distribution will be the same, but this distance is not zero. Yes. I'm just wondering, going off of what Isaiah was also saying, um, should this be measured for specific F or for the F that is somewhat optimal with respect to either performative you know, prediction or something else? I understand that for regulation, perhaps it makes sense to know the maximum damage or distance you can do to the population. But uh, maybe for some other 
settings that make sense to think about near optimal actions, how much do they change the system? No, yeah, I mean, these are like that's a that's a great comment. Near optimal or like local changes to what you're currently doing. Here, the reference point is the current state, so the current state of the market or like economy. And now you see what happens to changes. Um, I think that can I add like one thing just more? Like the soup, I think it's interesting because like a lot of regulation it talks about the ability to have like cause harm. That's often sufficient if there's like a potential for harm. It's in regulatory settings, often sufficient. You don't need to prove that like they have actually taken that action. It's just sufficient if they could potentially. Yeah. Maybe a version of taking a serious point into account would be to define just the ratio of how much I can treat it relative to how much it costs me. But then I don't need to take a stance on the action and set up how much cost it's willing to incur. It's more like how expensive it is it for me to shift behavior. Um, if you know that, might be a way to go about it. It's just a, um, I guess it's a different definition that avoids the arbitrary choice of F in some yeah. sense if there's a cost of yeah. But it introduces a comparison of units of like how yeah, do I, how like, I convert dollars profits to distribution systems. We we saw this back and forth, and there's like uh yeah, it's a bit of a problem in terms of normalizing um things. Um but let me let me just like talk to what we can do with that. I think there are like interesting variations of it, like in some patients or ways to think about it. This is an average treatment effect. So there's a huge toolkit. A lot of you are familiar with experimental designs, observational designs. So if this is actually something that's useful, it would mean that we can go look at statistical data to make like judgments about market power or economic power. Let's not say market power. It's like a different notion of power. So here are some advantages. I think we already touched upon some of them. I think it's nice that it gives the type signature to power, something that you can really measure. Um, it does not require a perfect understanding of the market. So you don't start from assuming, oh, it's like some corner competition, bird round competition, and then you try to say, yeah, learner index makes sense. You're, you're really more looking at the effect. And I think it's like an interesting um, direction to pivot into in like this um, digital markets, which are super complex. Um, yeah, I mentioned that it can be assessed from data. Now I wanna like, say a bit more about what it means in the context of prediction, which I think is like a very interesting um, aspect here, which is that, yeah, the role of power in prediction. Um, I think it's sort of something that's intuitively probably clear to you, but it's very nice to see it here expressed. So that's the problem that we've seen it before. Now I add and subtract two terms. It's still here, so I added and subtracted. What do I have here? Let's say D is any fixed distribution. I have Performative optima corresponds to the optimizing the risk on a fixed data D and steering to its data you prefer. Right. For any D, you can just find the best model, but you can potentially gain by steering. Sort of this, it's just, I think it's really nice how this like simple notion of distribution map makes like very clear um, how, how there's this component of optimizing versus steering whenever you have a distribution that depends on your decisions. So here, if we have zero performative power by the definition I introduced before, we are left with the first term. So the best that a firm can do is to just optimize on the given data. There's like, I think an interesting analog here to like price taking. You, all the best you can do is to optimize on the given conditions. But if you have high performative power, you gain to benefit from steering. And there's like also, I think an interesting analog to sort of price making, you can kind of steer the market towards something that you can have. And with performative power, under some like Lipschitz's assumption, you can show that the performative risk is no larger than the any supervised learning risk, um, or the the difference between the two is bounded by power. The more power you have, the more potential for steering. The more you can potentially gain by engaging in performative optimization versus supervised. Um, so yeah, what I want you, what I think, I want you to keep in mind that optimization in performative. Settings is not only about learning, it's also about steering. It's somehow about the loss function being Lipschitz in the C's. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Lipschitz in C, and then you can use Kantorovich, Rubinstein, Dr. Wasserstein, these things. It's like a very one line book, but it's more like about the conceptual um, takeaway. Um, yeah, that's what I have. So you can, that's like an interesting property of performative power. So it has an, yeah, it has a nice zero is good, large is potential buffer, which is something we like from non power. There's also, we can go and instantiate it in the multiplayer Suffici classification setting, and we get interesting properties showing that competition decreases power, monopoly maximizes power, and personalization also maximizes power. I've not included these results here because I thought this may be too, too heavy. Um, I wanna do a quick, oh, that's like another quote from the um, CIFLA committee to just like drive home the point that steering can lead to you should potential for harm and something we should like worry about in digital markets. Strategies such as offering addictive content at moments when consumers lack self-control increases time spent on the platform and profitable ad sales, even as the platform lowers quality of content. These tactics increase the welfare cost of market power. So this steering is really at the heart of a lot of these problems in digital economies. And there was a question online. Yeah. Make sure it's working. And inquest. Let's see if they come in later. I can take it at the end. Try again. Yeah. Okay, so steering, steering is something central to like issues of market power and digital economies. And here I want to just quickly highlight the Google Shopping antitrust case, which is one of the biggest antitrust cases in Europe. Um, it's, it's ongoing since 2010. And in 2017, the EU Commission found that Google has entrenched um, this article by abusing its dominant position in the search market for favoring its own comparison shopping service. And it's like a huge fight on it, 2.4 million. It's like, these are huge cases. It's really a big deal. And the key technical claim of the case was that arrangement of content on Google can steer traffic. That's like the central claim to the case because traffic is essential for business and steering traffic gives you a business advantage, drives out competitors. And that's like what, what the case, the, the sort of anti-competitive conduct is about. They call it self preference, like the theory of harm used here. Um, so it is about Google Shopping and it's about these boxes mostly and some sort of arrangement. It's about how a causal question of display is sort of at the heart of the investigation. They use like different like studies for like eye tracking studies or position bias studies as sort of support the arguments they're making in the case. Um, so why do I bring this up? Because I think from the power could have like an interesting role here as um, trying to get at the cause of question of the investigations. I'm not like saying that these this like I don't know how many 400 pages report. I mean, there's a it's like these are super complicated cases, but such a definition and like the concept of performativity could sort of help you to articulate the cause of question that's like at the center. It sort of links the ability to steer and this cause of power to, to the economic power of the firm. Um, it then makes very clear how causal inference tools can be applied. Um, it played a role in the case. Google responded with certain cleverly designed causal inference experiments to kind of refute the claims. But if you look at them carefully, you see exactly the issue in the experimental design that allowed them to refute it. But it's that the cause of question in the case. I mean, it's a great case. I don't want to criticize it. <laughs> it's just I I feel the cause of question was not like spelled out. And if it was, if they could spell it out, it's very obvious why like these counterclaims from Google don't make sense. Um, and it's it's a lot about like causal inference and data. And it's a really interesting case. I was very positively surprised when working through it. Um, there are sorry, in terms yeah. of your, if your notion of power idea. Right? To, to answer that experimentally, we have to try over the entire set F. 
Right. So if it's because if it's not a carbon effect, but actually it could have taken you can make assumptions, right? Let's say it's a the counterfeit, you can bound performative power by very so here, for example, there are existing results in the literature. People have studied an extra star half star rating in sort of Yelp causes a restaurant to sell out like 15% more frequently. Or you know that changing the ranking of ads in Google search changes the fixed rate by 21%. And you can translate the certain assumption, these results into bounds on performative power. You can define the set. It's giving you a lower bound because you have yes. at least some, some actions to the rest of it. And if you can show that the lower bound is significant to concern about, that's only. Um, another thing that's kind of, I find it interesting in this digital economies, you have a lot of options to do experiments. It's often feasible. Companies do it like all the time. And what they worked with in the case is mostly observational data. So they got like whatever terabytes of dumps they could like try to analyze. But experiments are very powerful in that context. You can get like very interesting insights. And I think there's like an interesting role for experiments to play in this investigation. And just like as a maybe like an ongoing thing I want to mention here, we are currently trying to sort of do a proof of concept for how experiments could be nice here. What we're doing is we have implemented a Chrome browser extension that can be installed and that uh, implements a randomized controlled trial on Google search. So if you have it installed, it randomizes the order of search results, ads. It, it can do a, we can uh, experiment a lot. It's like almost not noticeable if you have it installed, but it gives us really powerful data. Data is sent to like a backend server at the Max Planck, and then you can sort of do, hopefully, do interesting cost benefits on it. Currently, it's pending approval in the Chrome store, but I'm optimistic that it gets through. So you're kind of replicating what Google is doing in some sense? Um, they might do it, I don't know. In like, they definitely know what they are causing power, performance power, but they wouldn't have. So um, I think this is really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, in the beginning, you showed us this graph about what happened with, um, was it welfare benefits or no? Yeah, the, the yeah, poverty, poverty index yeah. and how it shifted to the left. So that seems like something the state probably didn't want, right? What we would want to do is that the population shifts to the right so that people escape poverty uh, according to the, to, to the index. So do you then think, um, given that you know, there is this performative power um, of the state, that the state should engage in these steering activities rather than just say, yeah, rather than not doing anything or just, you know, which leads, leads to some optimal results. Do you think basically they should, they should steer and they should nudge and, and do all these things? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the benefit of prediction, of using prediction is to cause change, right? That's what like the very purpose is in these like systems in education in like policy interventions prediction driven policies. Um, yeah, that's a nuance that we don't that we can't get at with like the mm -hmm. framework. There's just like there's a change, and we're like characterizing what's the effect of a change. But what a positive change? What's a sort of gaming the model where it's like improving, right? The poverty index, what we see is mostly due to like changes in how you report your features and not how they actually are. That's what happened here, but it's very hard to disentangle these. There's like interesting, interesting literature also just in the context. Yeah, I, I know from some literature in strategic classification that tries to make the difference between someone gaming the model or like actually improving to get above the decision boundary. Because mm -hmm. once you now know, know the decision rule, you can also like invest in improving, right? Mm -hmm. You can invest in like getting more credit worthy to then like get a positive classification or you can just go and buy more credit cards because you know that somehow ends it's like the FICO score. Mm -hmm. there, there are different ways and it's it's a very in, it's very interesting research questions. You can go about it in sort of more causal modeling, what is upstream, downstream of the Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not, I haven't made that distinction in talk, but it's a very important. And it's something that yeah. economics, not what text talks a lot about. Yeah, maybe I should, yeah, I should know more about that. You should send some pointers. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, that sort of what you're doing is, is definitely different from that, but the, the structure of the problem is very, very similar to optimal, like optimal tax theory, because if you 
right? If, if you just let theta be the tax schedule, right? Then basically, as you as you change the tax schedule, people's earning, I mean, people's actual earnings change and people's reported earnings change. And so even if you say the government's only goal is to maximize tax revenue, well, if you didn't account for the distribution share, exactly. all tax rates should be 100 percent. Exactly. But, the, but there's also a lot of like a very strong result of like using leveraging an envelope theorem, for instance, mm -hmm. assuming just the externalities of your behavior and other people, where all I care about is the effect of your behavioral change on the tax base. Mm -hmm. Everything else drops out in some sense, um, which which simplifies a lot of these problems massively. Yeah, I should look into this. I'm not I don't know the details. Um, Clarification question. What is the deep causal question at the heart of an investigation? What is that specifically? It's about the power, right? My understanding is I'm not an expert on competition law, but my understanding is a lot of competition law requires, at least for this kind of provision, the coexistence of market power with a misuse of that market power. And if I understand correctly, what you're talking about is the first thing. You still have to show that a corporation had in fact acted in a way to distort the market, right? Or are you proposing that this criterion could answer both those questions? Yeah, so that's like, it's not perfectly compatible with the current legislation because it's skipping the dominance part. You often need to establish dominance in the market because yeah. only if you're dominant, you are sort of have certain responsibilities. Yeah, exactly. And, but the reason why you're doing that is because only if you're dominant, you have a large effect. But we are go what we're doing is we're just measuring the effect. I think in certain cases you make can make like some conclusion about if the effect is there, then it must have been dominant. But we are not necessarily establishing dominance because the dominance concepts in a way they are defined. It's a bit it, it doesn't really map to what we're doing. So we are kind of skipping the dominance. We take the action and we take the effect and we say if the effect is large, it's bad. And maybe we can say if the effect is large, the firm must have been dominant, and then we are fine applying legislation as is. Do you understand what I'm? Yeah, but a related question. Yeah. Suppose this was become illegal law. Suppose I've got a startup in my garage with yep. two friends, and we come up with a fantastic product that will change the world. Is that not going to per se be illegal? And we can't solve it today, but it just feels like there are good policy reasons why we would typically want to see dominance before we believe that a firm's behavior should should be limited. I think, the point, this, this would radically change the way we think about a lot of firm innovations if merely exercising power on problematic. I think that if you are having your star corp in your garage and I define the population to be like the population of Germany, I will see a very small effect of what you're doing, even if what you're doing on the small people that you're affecting has a large effect. I think it depends on if you define the population to be large enough, you will not see high power in these cases. The well, last point I'll make is that if I understand the current operation, you can you can be dominant in a small market and behave completely inappropriately in that market, and that's prohibited. But the argument you just gave would also make that behavior okay. No, um, I'm saying that <laughs> the if you go about an investigation in that way, the first thing you do is you define the population that you're expecting harm to occur. And then you define the features such that what you're measuring the distance is something that you consider harmful. Because power per se is not bad, it has to be somehow harmful. And I think it's really in how you, it's just a different way of going about it. There's still a lot of like interesting, like, yeah. Uh, there's an online question from Sebastian Suzuka that says, how crucial is the assumption that strong convexity from the first part of the talk for the formal setup relevant uh, for these application um, cases? Do we have to assume the loss function of these markets or firm uh, is strictly convex? Is this a problem? Um, so the whole like formalism doesn't make any assumptions on the loss function. The, Convergence results of retraining, they need strong convexity. Um, the bound, uh, illustrative bound I showed on bounding the effect of steering needs some sort of literacy, but no strong convexity. So strong convexity is only, you can think of the formalism and the framework, allowing you to talk about these dimensions and then strong convexity if you want to do interesting optimization within the framework. So I guess coming to the back to the sort of antitrust question, I mean, I think 
is another way to think about this basically just as being about the, about the set of Fs. I, I think the notation was uh, the set of Fs I'm considering of essentially, if I had some notion of what I thought basically the you know consumer welfare maximizing action was, I could calculate power with just that action and the firm's sort of status quo action. Right, and so it's basically just like how much does what the firm's doing versus whatever we deem sort of socially optimal matter. Yeah, I mean, defining this counterfactual is like a very interesting question. And I think that's what this case, if you want to run such a case, what it is about is to find like the right, yeah, it, that's what like you need to find the right population or claim you want to make the actions you consider the counterfactual, also in terms of sort of remedy, if you want to suggest the remedy, you also need to spell out the counterfactual or you would actually, that's what you would want from such a case. I don't think it makes it much easier for the, it makes it both easier and harder for the investigator because you need to be very precise about like the, the claims you're making in that setting, but it offers you sort of some structural framework. Um, sure. and this, this case is highly complex and identifying the conduct, identifying the population, identifying what you want to measure, that's what it is about. That's the art of running such a case. Um, yeah, any, any other questions? I think I, oh, I have the summary slide. Um, <laughs> I'm actually almost there. Okay, so let me talk through again. Um, performativity, performative prediction as a conceptual framework, um, a very sim simple syntactic change to risk minimization, new algorithms, new solution concepts, new optimization challenges. Um, we can articulate the difference between burning and steering. That's, yeah. I'm not claiming that these are like completely new things, but it's just like a nice formalism. Um, performativity and the causal power of predictions could play an important role in digital market investigation. The causal power already does, and maybe performative power is useful. Currently exploring that with like a colleague from Tübingen who's an expert in competition policy. And yeah, I'm very curious to see where we get. Um, I think of performative prediction, it's a very nice framework to bring together concepts from machine learning, causality, we have seen behavioral economics, control theory, if you go about modeling interactions between platforms and participants, concepts from game theory, macroeconomics, and social science model. I think it's like a very nice playground for like interdisciplinary work. Thank you yeah, so much. <laughs> There is one last question online, which I think you've answered, but I'll ask it anyway. You lost me a bit when you suggested that if a model changes the distribution, it also changes. I had assumed that uh, a chosen population will come from a particularly a particular known distribution, which doesn't change. Maybe I heard you correctly. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So the idea is that the population depends on the model. So yeah. So. If the model changes, the population changes. That was my understanding. Of can that. change. Yeah, feel free to also ask later if you have anything to follow up on. Um, yeah, okay, so we have one more talk today, which is young at 4 p.m.